All right, welcome everybody. We are live on Albright's YouTube channel. So as usual, please don't do anything strange during the lecture because it will be recorded for posterity. Uh, I'm very happy tonight to tell you that this is the uh, third collaboration between the Albright Institute, the Tantour Ecumenical Institute, and the Notre Dame Jerusalem Global Gateway. And tonight's speaker uh, comes from the three of us, so I hope you all enjoy it. If you like what you see tonight, and if you like what you see on our YouTube channel, I think this is our sixth streamed lecture uh, with more than a thousand views worldwide just in the last few months. So there is an audience out there listening now, I hope. Uh, for those of you who are at home, you have the convenience of a, con a contribute link uh, right embedded into the video. So please take a minute right now and donate some money to the Albright. I'll wait. <laughs> I just made that up just now. But. OK, just a, a few notes about upcoming events. Uh, our next event will be Thursday, May 11th at 4 p.m. Noble Group fellow Zhao Feng will be talking about textile archaeology on the Silk Road. Uh, following that, on Thursday, May 25th at 4 p.m. will be our annual Shawarma Fest. Uh, all of you who are on our mailing list will be receiving invitations. Uh, so please look out for those if you're not on our mailing list. Uh, and you're at home, you can subscribe uh, from one of the links on our YouTube channel. Anyone here who would like to be on our mailing list, please see Sarah or myself. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite our longtime associate fellow, Shimon Gibson, to in introduce the speaker. Thank you. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our lecturer this afternoon, Felicity Cobbing, who is the executive and curator of the Palestine Exploration Fund in London. Felicity, known to her friends as Flick, participated as a staff member on archaeological excavations in the region, more specifically during the British Museum's campaign at Tel Sadia, and has traveled extensively in Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon, as well as in his country. Her specialized academic interests include archaeology of the Levant, history of exploration in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and historical geography and ethnography. Felicity also leads specialized archaeological tours to the Middle East and North Africa, previously for the British Museum, but currently she is associated with the Martin Randall Travel Company. She has lectured in the UK and across the world on a variety of subjects connected to the history of archaeology of the Near East. Felicity joined the Palestine Exploration Fund in 1998, first as curator of its archives and subsequently as executive sec secretary in 2006. The holdings of the PEF include museum artifacts collected by the 19th century explorers, photographs, documents and letters, maps and diagrams, squeezes of inscriptions and excavation records. To promote the registration of the vast archival materials of the PF, Felicity runs an active volunteer program with students and pensioners with sorting and identifying work carried out on the archival materials with repacking and cataloging. Felicity's publications include numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, chapters and books, reviews and various papers, and three books. Her first book, entitled Beyond the River, Ottoman Transjordan in Original Photographs, co-authored with historical geographer Rauf Saad Abu Jabal, was published by Stacey International in 2005. In 2012, Felicity produced with co-authors Rachel Halot and Jeffrey Spur a monograph, ASOR Annual Number 66, entitled The Photographs of the American Palestine Exploration Society. It dealt primarily with the photographs of Tancred Dumas, whose studio was in Beirut, and with the history of the American PEF, which has the unfortunate uh, acronym APES. <laughs> Her most recent book, published in 2015 with Equinox Publishers, written with David Jacobson, is entitled Distant Views of the Holy Land, as it, and is an overall appreciation of the work of PEF explorers. This afternoon, Felicity will be talking to us about the work of John Garstang, who served in a mandate period as a director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, and as the director of the Palestine Department of Antiquities. Among other things, he formulated the original antiquities law for this country in 1920. He was also, among other things, the official representative of the PF in Jerusalem, 
and the PF archive in London includes materials relating to his excavations in the Holy Land, notably at Hatzor, Ashkelon, and Jericho. We're all looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Shimon. Let me get this. Okay, can you hear me? Is that all right? Good. Right, well, thanks ever so much, Shimon, and thank you to the Tantor in uh, Institute, Jerusalem Global Gateway, and the Albright Institute for organizing this trip. I am thrilled to be here speaking to you. Oh, goodness me. Next to Petrie's chamber pot, which is in this corner. I, I'm just overwhelmed. It's fabulous. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and it's auspicious because uh, it's Star Wars Day. Did you realize that? May the 4th be with you. Mm -hmm. So, that's an important thing to know, I feel. Um, just before I get on to the lecture, for those of you who don't know about the PEF, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about the organization. Um, and the work that it's conducted here over the years. We were founded in 1865 uh, by a very um, eclectic group of people, scholars, clerics, soldiers, politicians, social do-gooders, the whole gamut, um, to pull together a, um, a reliable set of information about the physical reality of this southern Levant. So everything from geography to flora, flora and fauna, archaeology, manners and customs, as it was called, and so on. And because uh, we were the first organization of, our, uh, of, the, of its kind in the world, we're really, um, uh, uh, we have a unique role, as it were, in the development of subjects in this region. So it's worth remembering that all of you are here because of us, <laughs> I think. It's a good thing to remember. But now on to the lecture, on to John Garstang, who comes a little bit later on in the mandate period uh, from 1919 onwards. And his excavations at Jericho. Now then, I can't. Is this on or off? It's on. It looks like it's off. There. Brilliant. Oh, what did I manage to do? Sorry. OK. Um, all the illustrations here, most of them anyway, except for the really kitsch ones, come from the PEF. <laughs> okay. The city of Jericho is a particularly famous biblical site, even though it features fairly infrequently in the Hebrew Bible. It is most known from the story told in the book of Joshua. And I'm assuming that most people are familiar with the story. Anyone not? Okay, right. Um, in any event, Joshua's conquest of Jericho is a linchpin in the biblical story of the wandering Israelites' entry into the promised land and is therefore crucial for the creation of the biblical kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon sometime later. And there we go. Some of the kitsch bits. Whee! <laughs> the area around the spring of Ain el-Sultan on the west bank of the Jordan River has been identified with ancient Jericho as far back as the year AD 333, when it is mentioned by the Bordeaux pilgrim. The mound of Tel Sultan, adjacent to the spring, was first investigated archaeologically by the Palestine Exploration Fund, both by Charles Warren in 1868 and by Claude Conder in 1874. The site was excavated by Ernst Sellin and Charles Watzinger for the German Oriental Society between 1907 and 1909 and in 1911. The German expedition revealed a great deal, particularly about the second millennium BC Middle Bronze Age defensive systems and the preceding early Bronze Age walls. Portions of what the excavators characterized as Israelite occupation, dating from the 11th to 6th century BC, were also found. John Garstan came to the site in 1930 and with sponsorship from numerous sources conducted excavations there until 1936. His results were controversial from the word go. Garstan claimed that he had excavated evidence of the violent destruction of a late Bronze Age city, dating to around 1400 to 1385 BC. 
He attributed this destruction to an earthquake which aided the conquest of the site by Joshua and the Israelites. Initially, the controversy was not over his attribution of an archaeological event to a biblical story. That was nothing new. In fact, finding the Bible in the dirt of Palestine was, and sometimes still is, all the rage. But rather, the controversy was over the dating of the destroyed city itself. W.F. Albright preferred a date of 1375 to 1300, whilst Père Vincent of the École Biblique favoured an even later date of 1250 BC. Some years later, Garstang asked the brilliant British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon to look again at his results. This she did using the archival material from the excavations which Garstang had gifted to the PEF in 1949. She published her findings in the 1951 edition of the Palestine Exploration Quarterly. The following year, she began excavations of the site herself, which lasted until 1958. Her results were dramatic. The walls attributed by Garstang to the Late Bronze Age and Joshua's destruction were in fact several thousand years older, belonging to the early Bronze Age of the third millennium. In addition, there was very little in the way of Late Bronze Age settlement at Jericho at all. As a consequence, the likelihood of an Israelite army destroying the town began, become, begins to evaporate. The early Bronze Age is too early by anyone's reckoning for these events to have plausibly taken place. The prosperous Middle Bronze Age is followed with regional domination by Egypt in the Late Bronze Age, making it highly unlikely that such an invasion of Canaan, as it is told in the Bible, could have happened at this time. The most plausible window for such an event to occur is towards the end of the Late Bronze Age, around 1200 BC, when the Egyptian Empire was collapsing and could therefore, was therefore powerless to halt such movements of people. However, the fact that, as Kenyon demonstrated, the occupation of Jericho during the Late Bronze Age was minimal, and no walls dating to this time were destroyed by trumpet or otherwise, and the entire story, not only of the destruction of Jericho, but also the Israelite conquest of Canaan, becomes questionable. In the aftermath of these revelations, Poor old Garstang has been seized upon, particularly by the media and general public, to exemplify the dangers of linking archaeological finds too explicitly to biblical texts, only to come a cropper a few years down the line when somebody else comes along with a different and testable interpretation. However, this scapegoating of Garstang and his work at Jericho is, I believe, most unfair to the man who is largely responsible for establishing the administration of archaeological excavation research and publication in British Mandate Palestine, and who made a significant contribution to the advancement of the subject itself. In addition, it misrepresents Garstang's own ideological position in relation to archaeology. Let me begin with a brief synopsis of Garstang's life and career. Although not such a household name as Flinders Petrie or Kathleen Kenyon, for example, John Garstang was an archaeologist of considerable energy who achieved a great deal in his professional career. Born in 1876, he started off his academic life as a mathematician, studying the subject at Jesus College, Oxford. Whilst there, his interest in archaeology took hold, and aged 23, he joined Flinders Petrie at his excavations at Abydos in Egypt. From 1904 to 1909, he dug at Sachet Gerzou in Anatolia, returning in 1911. From 1918, uh, well, that can't be right. From 1919, no, 1909 until the First World War, he directed excavations at numerous sites in Egypt, including Abydos, Beni Hassan, and Nakada. From 1909 to 1914, he excavated the site of Meroe in Sudan. At the tender age of 26, he was appointed honorary reader in uh, Egyptology at Ar of Egyptian archaeology at Liverpool University. And five years later, in 1907, he became professor of the methods and practice of archaeology, a post which he held until his retirement in 1941. In 1919, he was appointed the first director of both the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, the BSAJ, now the Kenyan Institute, and of the Department of Antiquities and the newly formed British Mandatory Government of Palestine. He excavated a number of sites in Palestine, including Ashkelon, Hatsor, and of course Jericho. 
After World War II, Garstang went again to Anatolia, where in 1947 he became the founding director of the British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara. He excavated at Mersin in Cilicia, uncovering Neolithic and Bronze Age remains, and he died in 1956 in Beirut. The Egyptian gallery at the University of Liverpool's Garstang Museum displays much from his own excavations at Egypt. This gallery is particularly illuminating with regards to his personality, as well as his achievements and working methods in the field. Garstang's interest in the ordinary burial practices of ordinary ancient Egyptians was unusual at a time when many were focusing on the remains left by the elite. It seems also that he was a talented fundraiser with a gift for touching the wealthy benefactors and institutions for money to fund his excavations, and this is something to which we will return. As previously mentioned, Garstang's career in Palestine began when he was appointed as the first director of the BSAJ in 1919, following the First World War. At the same time, he was also made the first director of the British uh, Department of Antiquities in Palestine, a job which he held for six years. This double job, one would be enough for most, put him in an extraordinary position and effectively made him the architect of British antiquities policy and practice, as well as putting him in direct control of the program of research. Garstang was an ideal choice for this hugely significant role. He was industrious and very capable, but unassuming and gentlemanly in his manner. With the potentially thorny issues and prickly personalities he would have encountered, his personal traits are exactly what was needed. Under his directorship, the framework for the antiquities policy in Palestine was designed, refined and put into practice. His approach was pragmatic and enlightened and established a robust framework which helped generate what's, what, what was undoubtedly a very fruitful period of archaeological research in the region. In 1922, Garstang, together with Albright of uh, the American Schools of Oriental Research and Père Vincent of the École Biblique met to thrash out a system of chronological classification for Palestine's archaeological material and put in place the system which, broadly speaking, we adhere to today. Perhaps the most visible sign of Garstang's impressive contribution to the archaeological heritage of Palestine is what is now called the Rockefeller Museum, home now to the Israel Antiquities Authority but under the British mandate, the headquarters for a few years of the Department of Antiquities of Palestine. The present iconic building designed by Austin Harrison was finished in 1938, sometime after Garstang's time as director of the Department of Antiquities. However, the existence of the museum itself and the significance of its collections can be largely attributed to his industry, both as the designer of British archeological policy in Palestine and as a field archeologist himself. Following the First World War, the British Mandate inherited a collection of archaeological material from numerous excavations which the Ottoman administration had brought together as a significant museum exhibit in the last few years of the 19th century. The exhibits included, among other things, materials from the British PEF excavations at sites uh, in Jerusalem and the Shafela sites of Tel Sandahana, Tel Judeida and Tel Safi. The Ottomans enlisted the expertise of American archaeologist Frederick Jones Bliss as a consultant, much to the chagrin of his British employers, the PEF, who would have preferred to see the fruits of their labour and money back in the UK. Finds from later digs include the PEF's excavations at Tel Geza and Beth Shemesh, and these are also how, were housed in this Ottoman museum, which had its first home in the Mamounia School building in the Old City. Under Garstang's directorship, this collection was protected and rehoused, first in the Citadel from 1921 to 24, and then at the British School of Archaeology, which also served for a time as the headquarters for the Department of Antiquities itself. John Garstang appointed his close friend and colleague, W.J. Fithian Adams, as the first keeper of the Palestine Museum. But it is very clear from the PEF's archives that Garstang, as director of both the Department of Antiquities and the BSAJ, took a close interest in the development of the museum. During the mandate period, the already impressive collections were enhanced by material from several important excavations, including Petrie's excavations at Tel Al-Ajul, Tel Farah and Tel Gemma, the joint expedition to Samaria, 
Albright's excavations at Telbait Mir Sim, and with the Welcome Marston expedition to Tel Duir, ancient Lachish, under the direction of James Starkey. In addition, material from Garstang's own excavations, including those at Jericho, were added to the collections. John Garstang gifted a wealth of our archival material to several institutions, including the Palestine Exploration Fund and the Liverpool University. The PEF holds his records from Ashkelon and Hatzor and all the records from his Jericho excavations and numerous photographs of sites throughout the country. It's an amazing resource, actually, particularly the photographs of sites which, in a landscape which now has been ut utterly altered. He was a very fine photographer and a meticulous record keeper. His photograph albums of his excavations at Jericho are a minor miracle of care and attention and a lesson to us all in thoroughness. So it is clear that John Garstang was no fool. He understood the material culture of ancient Palestine and indeed the material culture of many parts of the Eastern Mediterranean as well as anyone in his day. And he was a careful and scientific man. So let us turn now to his excavations at Jericho. The first season at Jericho was in 1931 and the last in 1936. The excavations were not under the auspices of the BSAJ or the PEF, as one might expect, but were sponsored by numerous British and French organisations, as well as individual sponsors such as Lord Melchett and Mr Davies Bryan. However, the main sponsor was Sir Charles Marston which gave this individual a great deal of influence in the project, a subject to which I will return later. Garstang excavated in several areas on the site, uncovering remains from all periods of the site's history. He identified the following phases of occupation at the site, dating them from the 4th to the 1st millennium BC, with five main city phases, four of which fall within the Bronze Ages. Okay. Just to point out, the bits, uh, Garstang's trenches are kind of outlined in yellow here, and the double walls are picked out in the blue. Garstang's excavations uncovered much of interest from the early levels of the site, which contributed to a greater understanding of the Neolithic in Palestine. Following subsequent excavations at numerous sites, it would transpire that the dates he gave to these early levels were far too late. But nevertheless, his excavations of this Neolithic material marks the start of our detailed understanding about this highly significant period in the region. However, the subject of today's talk is not the Neolithic phase at Jericho, for which this site is as famous as it is for the biblical story. I will focus instead on the particular features Garstang associated with Joshua's alleged destruction, in particular his double-walled rampart, which he attributed to his city four, the interpretation of which was so controversial. It is clear from the archives and from Garstang's actions following his excavations that the dating of the double walls gave him a great deal of trouble. At no stage do you feel, if you're looking at the archives as I have, that he was entirely happy with the solution. Given his uncertainty, it seems bizarre that this careful and precise man should make such a definite and public statement as the one he came to be associated with. Kathleen Kenyon's 1951 article actually explains the mechanics of Garstang's error. Firstly, he was confused by the extent of mixing of ceramic material caused by erosion from wind, from rain, from general weathering. This is obvious from the archives and the published sections which show he did not really see it This error had a particular effect on his dating of the use of the palace storerooms. These extensive storerooms were filled with storage jars packed with foodstuffs. The large storage jars were demonstrably Middle Bronze Age and therefore attributed to his city three. But the erosion of the site had brought down later material into these contexts, leading him to suggest that they were partially restored and remained in use some way during the late, late Bronze Age, his city four despite being so comprehensively destroyed by fire. As a result, Garstang's late Bronze Age City 4 was a pretty extensive affair. Secondly, he forgot about the slope and how that could affect 
the levels of the site and therefore the stratigraphy. Thirdly, he did not see a level of silting. Without it, Garstang again saw a continuous occupation of the site from the Middle Bronze Age through the 15th and 14th centuries, ending with the destruction of what he saw as a major city in about 1400 BC. With the silting layer, Kenyon saw a hiatus in the occupation of Jericho between the Middle and Late Bronze Age, lasting some 150 years from about 1550 to about 1400 BC. Finally, Garstang's understanding of the pottery of the early Late Bronze Age I period was, as, that w as was that of his peers, not as complete as it would become just a few years later. This, together with the factors described above, was in part what led to his error in continuing the occupation of the palace storerooms into that City Fall period. In Kenyon's 1951 article, the major difference between her own conclusions and those of Garstang were the scale of City Four occupation and the history of the site between the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. Garstang saw the continuous extensive occupation right the way through the Middle Bronze Age and well into the Late Bronze Age, with the destroyed City Three being replaced immediately with his City Four. Kenyon saw the destruction of City Three as the end of significant occupation at Jericho to be followed by a period of abandonment that lasted 150 years, and then with a brief period of resettlement rep represented by the double-walled rampart, itself abandoned some 50 years later. What is interesting is that even at this stage, the extent of the error was not realized by Kenyon, working as she was from Garstang's records. She only gave a difference of dating of some 30 to 50 years at the most where Garstang put the destruction of City 4 at 1400 to 385 BC, Kenyon dated the end of Jericho to 1350 BC. With the exception of the silting layer, which she also observed in the tombs, and her recognition that the later material in the palace storerooms was intrusive, she broadly confirmed Garstang's stratigraphy, including the observation he had made that his double-walled rampart was built on top of a layer of debris that backed up inside the Middle Bronze Age glacis and wall at the bottom of the tell, making it of late Bronze Age date. It was only on her own re-excavation of these areas from 1952 to 1958 that she was able to analyze the stratigraphy and the associated ceramic data sufficiently to realize that this was a mistake. At this point, she arrived at the startling conclusion that Garstang's double walls should in fact be dated to the early Bronze Age and that consequently the Jericho of Joshua did not exist. This slide shows Kenyon's famous section of Trench 1 and the original draw uh, printing plate which we found in the PEF's archives in 2015. Isn't it lovely? It reveals the incredible detail of which she recorded which enabled her to see far more accurately the sequence of building, destruction, deposition, and erosion, which had formed the tell of ancient Jericho over the millennia. Her approach was a natural evolution from the principles of archeology span laid down by Flinders Petrie in the 19th century and developed to an extraordinary degree. And her results were earth shattering, sorry, and conclusive. Kenyon's examination of Garstang's records, combined with her own work at the site, demonstrated that his mistake was perfectly understandable given the complexity of the stratigraphy. Anyone could have made the same mistake. His real error, however, was not an archaeological one, but rather was a profound error of judgment in linking his uncertain conclusions with a biblical event. So why did this scientifically objective and generally cautious man do so? It seems oddly out of character. And I believe the answer lies with money and the character of his most significant sponsor, Sir Charles Marston. Oh, where's Sir Charles Marston gone? There he is. Charles Marston was a British industrialist and a keen archaeological enthusiast. He had been involved in British archaeology for some time when in 1924 he embarked on a trip to the Holy Land. He met R.A.S. McAllister, who was then conducting the Ophel excavations on behalf of the Palestine Exploration Fund and the Daily Telegraph. As a result of this meeting, Sir Charles became a very active member of the PEF and served on its committee for some years. 
He contributed to funding of several important excavation, excavations, including Crowfoot's later Ophel excavations, Petrie's work at Ajul, and later the excavations at Tel Duir led by Starkey. Charles Marston was also a devout fundamentalist Christian with more than a streak of the firebrand preacher about him. It is clear from his biography, written by his daughters, that for him, archaeology was in the service of his faith. And I quote, the Bible is substantially true and I want to prove it. He once told the American journalist Alfred Murray. For a man like Charles Marston, the archaeology of a site like Jericho would naturally uncover the history so eloquently described in the biblical accounts. A list of his own book titles gives an idea of his religious beliefs. I think it is entirely plausible that Garstang, in the face of no other explanation at the time, and with the considerable influence of Marston's point of view bearing down on him, basically caved in. Oh, all right then, let's say it was Joshua. You can almost hear him say. In 2016, while sorting through some archives at the PEF, we found a photo belonging to Canon C.B. Mortlock, who was, among other things, honorary secretary of the PEF and an archaeological reporter for the Telegraph. The front shows a picture of Joshua's walls, as characterised in the popular imagination already. But what is really revealing is what Mortlock has written on the reverse. At the bottom, in this section here, he writes, Prof. G is not satisfied with the evidence that this is the wall of the era of Joshua. Quite clearly, Garstang was not happy with this interpretation, and this small item is proof of it. In hindsight, he should have stuck to his guns. If he had simply dated the walls as he was only able to conclude from the evidence as he had it, but had not linked the destruction to the biblical account, history would not have been so hard on him. I think that John Garstan came to bitterly regret his error, and his colleagues were aware of this. Interestingly, towards the end of the excavations at Jericho, plans were being made to excavate the site of Tel Duir. Marston's biographers write, when James Leslie Starkey first asked Sir Charles to support the plans of excavations at Tel Duir, he made it very clear that he had no expectations that anything would be found to confirm that the Bible was a true account of historical events. Ironically, whereas Jericho's biblical links were to prove, prove unfounded, Duir's were spectacularly confirmed as the city of Lachish the archaeology graphically corroborating the biblical accounts of the Assyrian and Babylonian sieges. Christopher Davy has described to me some of the correspondence in the Australian Institute of Archaeology's archive. A proportion of their collection was given to them by John Garstang. Following discussions with the Institute's founder, Walter Beasley, Christopher wrote to me in that, in his opinion, Garstang was extremely wary of Beasley's own very biblical leanings and his approach to archaeology as a tool for proving it to be true. In addition, the minutes of the Institute reveal that his proposed trip in 1950 was cancelled due to the difference of opinion between Garstang and the Institute. And finally, whilst Garstang was di director of the school in Ankara, the Institute sent him £500, which he returned. No longer was he to be seduced by those with cash, whose intellectual position he did not agree with. I think we need to step back a little from Garstang's big mistake and see it in the context of archaeological knowledge at the time. If there are lessons to be learned, is that it, it is that even the most talented and measured of people can make mistakes, and that sponsors with strong opinions can be a liability from time to time. The story also reveals the real revolution which Kenyan methodology was to have on the archaeology of the Southern Levant. From Jericho on, it became clear that the control and observation to an almost obsessive degree was necessary to extract enough information to formulate a reliable reconstruction of events at any given site. In some ways, Garstang's excavations at Jericho can be seen as the last of the old school of archaeology in the region which took its methodology directly from Flinders Petrie in the late 19th century. His method was sound, but just did not go far enough, given the nature of the material. Kenyon's excavations at Jericho marked the birth 
of the modern age of archaeology. Her method was an evolution from that of Petrie and Garstang, but her results revolutionised the way in which archaeology was practised. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, hand on. Yeah, 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 undoubtedly. I think so, to a, to a degree. I think most people were. Um, I think there's um, almost any person working in the archaeology of Palestine in that period from the 19th century onwards had at the back of their mind to some degree, possibly just an assumption, even if they weren't aware of it, that they were going to find something of biblical significance. And um, it, it's kind of in, 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 in your cultural heritage to, to think that way. I think that John Garstang was very interested in the story of Joshua, certainly anyway, and he published books on the issue and so on. So yes, I do think that that was a case with him, but I don't think it was the same as a kind of um, biblical archaeology perspective where you have um, an ideological um, uh, uh, remit to go out and find the Bible. Yeah, that's a stronger position, and I don't think Garstang was part of that. He was, he, yeah, he, he loved it. He, li he wanted her to get involved. He was the reason that Kenyon came to Jericho. He, he, yes, he said, come please, I know there's an issue. Come and help me sort it out. So he knew. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, my question is, how long did Marsh, was Marsh Ah. Uh, and the, the question hmm. is more related to if he was so influenced by money, he didn't publish his book until 1940. And then the second edition of the book, would he still have a vested interest in sort of answering to Marsh? 10 years, 12 years no, after he's no, I don't think he. I don't think that 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 relationship would have been important at that stage. I think that he felt something was really wrong, and he, in, in in fact, in one of the editions of the book that he published, it there's a little note at the bottom, which which says that he knows there's a mistake there. Um, it's kind of hidden, but, but he doesn't actually change it. But in the text. No, I mean, I, I just don't think he was ever happy with it, and I don't think that. Um, I mean, Marston was very influential, but by that stage, I think his influence was coming to an end, despite the, the Dewey excavation. Hi. Hi, Sam. Is the footnote of Marston responsible for Ellen Rhodes? So he was. That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, earthquake, lots of them. Um, yeah, the whole region. I mean, you think about where it is. It's in the Jordan Valley, which is the top part of the rift, and it's a very seismically active zone. And the um, early Bronze Age, the end of the early Bronze Age, is a period when there's a lot of activity, and not just at Jericho, but at many other sites in the region. You know, you find yourself ex excavating. Oh, where's my floor gone? 
and then you find it 50 centimetres down. So, it, you know, there's a lot of destruction at lots of sites in Jericho in well, particular. Well, became a legend. Yes. Uh, and and the, the legend was picked up. Yeah. By the right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are these ruins there, yeah. visible for years and years and years. And that's often, you know, one way in which stories are inspired. And if you've got, uh, if you've got a re you want to tell an epic story, then this is, you know, very good material. Hi. Are there <clears throat> other places where the attempt to force biblical connection mm. onto the site happening in the place? All over the place. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Everywhere. <laughs> It's a particular, it's a type site for this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hi. No. Sorry, sorry. One there, then you, then you at the back. Okay. Hi. Mm. 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 Yeah, and, and certainly the way that he, he is represented in kind of, you know, essays on biblical archaeology, he comes across as a bit of an idiot sometimes, and I just don't think he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think that was Kenyon's intention at all. He had a lot of, she had a lot of respect for him. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi. Does the recent um, Italian excavation mm. in Jericho favor Kenyon? Kenyon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, their excavations are, are very much following um, Kenyon's model. Um, they have found some interesting bits and pieces as well, but I don't think enough to shake the foundations, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Father Ross. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where where do you begin? <laughs> um, I think there are there are real issues. It's it's um, sometimes there are. Um, it's not so much an issue of um, dating or mischaracterizing something, but of the way it's presented as much as anything else, so that the idea that people get when they go and visit a place is perhaps not entirely fair on the archaeology as, it's, as it really is. Sometimes separate phases seem to be conflated to make something a bit more impressive. Um, and sometimes uh, people read into the archaeology a little bit more than can really necessarily be um, extrapolated from the results. And so, uh, you know, everybody loves a headline, don't they? And that's certainly something that has happened at the City of David, I think, from time to time. Yeah. And elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like people come here and they dig and they get Jerusalem syndrome, you know? <laughs> in in a kind of archaeological way. <laughs> Hi, Dan. These uh, projects. Yeah. We here at work deal with one way, shape, or form, either technology, technology, or whatever it is. Mm. Work team, the people that don't get their name on the state test, think, make sure that situations like this don't happen. Mm. Careers aren't really don't lose fun. But what were you going to go back and look at the case study? Is there a chance that other people can make something? Or Cool. Um, I suppose if he'd have had a different sponsor who maybe was slightly less um, 
uh, obsessed with a particular result. I think I think Marston learned from this as well. That's the other thing. I think that after this and after it was shown to be not the truth, as it were, um, then uh, at Lahish and so on, he learned just to maybe hang back a little bit and not be quite so bombastic about his opinion. And I think that it's important for, uh, let's say, that support team to not, you know, to allow the archaeology just to be. You know, we want we, rather than try and you know give it an identity before it's even been found. That's really <laughs> important, and to um, not, uh, you know, it's exciting enough as it is. It doesn't need any more dressing up. Allow it to be what it is, and if it is something that fits well um, with a biblical account or text, then fantastic, wonderful, whoopee. But don't decide that before you can actually show that that's the case. Hi. So he wanted some, he wanted a big thing. So, mm. Yeah. Because the hard working man was mm. building the administration, the hard working field archaeologist. I think you may, yeah, that's potentially very true. Yeah. Hi, Elliot. Just a little comment. By saying did not just leave it in the text. He published reports in the the annals of Liverpool. Liverpool, anyway, yeah. They're pretty good reports for their time. Mm. They're full of uh, drawings, photographs, and there's still a, not a little utility today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're not bad. Kevin also made some mistakes. <laughs> The mayor uh, Peter Carr and Thomas Allen also went back, redated the very early, some mm -hmm. of the early Bronze Age walls. Yeah. You know, like, it's going to happen to all of us. Yes, and, absolutely. Maybe that's the message is, you know, don't, don't, uh, yeah, we're all, we all have feet of clay. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And thank you, everybody back home. If you're still online, good. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Are we off? Oh, yeah.